Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Barry Aitken. I'm an ethics fellow in the public policy program at the Alan Turing Institute, and I'm really delighted to be hosting today's Turing Lecture. The Turing Lectures are the Institute's flagship lecture series, which have been running since 2016 and virtually since April 2020. They are free for all to attend, and we aim to make them as open and ac as accessible as possible. Um, before we kick things off, I just have a few housekeeping notes from the organisers to go through. Firstly, today's event will be sub subtitled. If you can't see the subtitles and you would like to, hit the CC button on the bottom toolbar of your screen um, and then the subtitles will, will come on for you. If you're on Twitter, we'd love for you to discuss and feedback on the lecture throughout the lecture. Um, if you're on Twitter, please do um, tag us using the hashtag Turing Lecture. And don't forget to tag, sorry, please do use the hashtag Turing Lecture. Um, and don't forget to tag us at Turing Inst. We're looking forward to hearing your questions and comments and to having some discussion um, at the end of the lecture. You can submit questions via the Zoom Q&A function. So please put your questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat. Um, and you can post them throughout the lecture. We'd love for you to, to come on live and ask your questions directly to our speaker today. If you're happy to turn your camera on and, and ask your question live, um, please write ask live um, in brackets after your question. Uh, and then we will bring you on as, as a panelist to ask your question. Of course, if you prefer to keep your camera off, if you prefer to stay more incognito, that's absolutely fine. Uh, you can put your question into the Q&A and, and I will read the questions out uh, on your behalf. We're expecting quite a lot of questions this afternoon and we may not have time to get through as many as we would like. So apologies in advance if we don't get around to, to asking your question. But we'd really encourage you to use the upvote function in the Q&A to upvote other audience members' questions. So if there's a question that's similar to the one you want to ask, or if there's a question that you really would like to hear the answer to, please upvote those questions and we'll aim to get through as many of, of, the, of those questions as possible. This lecture is being recorded um, and the lecture, it will be hosted on YouTube after the event. So if you need to leave early, if you can't stay till the end, you'll be able to catch up later uh, on YouTube and we'll make sure we share the links to the recording uh, on the social media channels after the lecture. Finally, the chat function is open, um, but please be reminded of our events code of conduct and keep all messages friendly and professional. There's a link to the code of conduct in the chat, uh, which you can refer to. So now on to the, uh, on to the exciting bit. Uh, now to Professor Noor Shaker, our distinguished lecturer. Noor is a serial biotech entrepreneur with a track record of achievements in AI, having held an assistant professorship from Alberg University. Noor has published numerous papers in the field of artificial intelligence and its application to drug discovery, and is an inventor on a handful of patents. She is passionate about data and AI and on a mission to cure disease with the power of human and machine learning. Noor is currently the CEO at Glamorous AI, a biotech company that pushes the boundaries to what is possible to put AI to cure debilitating diseases. Noor is a recognized healthcare leader, an MIT innovator under 35, and she's in BBC's 100 Women. She's received a COGEX UK Rising Star Award from the then Prime Minister for AI technology that will transform drug discovery to treat chronic diseases. So without further, further ado, I'm really pleased to hand over to Noor Shaker. Thank you very much, Mary. Thanks very much. Really, I really appreciate the, the nice intro. And hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. And um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I'll start by sharing my screen. And we'll go from there. Do you see the screen? All good? Awesome. Thank you. All right. Hi again, everyone. Uh, I'm Noor Shaker. And again, I have a background, deep background, I'd say, in, in AI machine learning and transformed into the AI for drug discovery space, um, I would say about five, six years ago. And I've been focusing since then on what I call translation research. So basically translation of, of AI machine learning specifically to drug discovery. And what I would like to talk to you about today is um, where those ideas come from, what are what is the current step, status of AI in drug discovery, and how we make the next leap um, in AI approaches for drug discovery. So if you're familiar with the AI for the drug discovery landscape or the pharmaceutical industry, then you, you probably heard about what's called EROM's law, which is the exact opposite to Rome's law, as, as you know, probably from a computational back, if you are from a computational background, then you would um, know that this looks the exact opposite in a sense that there is an expected drop 
uh, by at least 50% in R&D productivity every nine years. And that comes from the fact that it is becoming more and more expensive to produce one drug. So we have to put more money, more billions of dollars into the production, into taking one drug to market. Um, and if you're curious about this subject, then you'd probably enjoy reading one of the, the very nice, it's a very nice book actually on the subject. And it's basically a background of whether, what's kind of the, the role of luck or serendipity in, in the discovery of new, of new medicines and how scientists have to be really open-minded about their experiments, what they're looking for, because in most cases, development of new drugs come from the fact that you basically um, just noticing something that you weren't really looking at, and that's kind of where some come, come, comes in, um, kind of adds in a very big factor in the discovery of new medicines. So over the past, I would say, decade, it's been really difficult for us to, to invent new drugs. Usually it takes about 15 years to, to bring one drug to market. Um, at the current rate, it costs about 2.6 billion to, to, to develop one drug. So it's really not kind of a very efficient or productive uh, market, really. And just to kind of talk a little bit about what is really the problem, what, what, what we're solving for. Um, so so for, you, for those of you who don't, who don't really have a background in biology, what you see here is what we call a protein target, um, which is really a sequence of amino acids um, and sequence of, of um, atoms, chemistry. Um, that basically modulate, modulate the function of our body. And in our body, there is an estimate of about 180 known proteins. That's really a huge number of proteins and they differ in the shape and in, the, in their function. And usually what we're looking for is um, basically a small, what we call a small molecule drug that interacts with, um, with a protein in a specific way to um, basically modulate its function, change the way it functions. So it interacts within, within an area that we call it the binding site. And the idea of drug discovery or the main purpose of doing drug discovery is to find or actually design those small molecules to fit in that specific pocket in, in a specific, uh, what we call binding mode or 3, 3D conformation. So in a specific pose to unlock that uh, protein function. So again, there are like 180 protein, proteins in our, uh, in our body and there are like billions of ways we can design, design those small molecules. So it's, it's really a complicated task. And it's really complicated because there is a huge number or like one, one of the main aspects why it is really challenging is, is the sheer number of compounds um, or small molecule drugs, that could, small molecule compound that could potentially become drug. So if you look at the number of um, potential drug candidates that could become drug, then there is an estimate of about 10 to the power of 60. Um, that is, if you think about how big that number is, it's almost as big as the number of atoms in, in the entire universe, really. And what we have discovered as a hu as human um, is just a very, very tiny fraction of that number. So the libraries that we usually screen, that we usually try and search for, search within to identify our, our targets um, are usually very, very small, hundreds of millions of compounds. And we're expanding them as we go, but it's still far from the actual number of compounds that we could actually design. So here comes the AI and machine learning, and we were thinking about ways to improve our ability to design those libraries, to design those small molecules that, that you've seen in the previous slides to kind of expand our ability as a human to um, tap into uncharted areas in the chemical space um, and really think about designing chemistry in a new way. And what you see here in this slide is basically faces for people that are that, that never existed on Mother Earth. So those are as, as realistic as they look, they're not really pictures for real human beings. Uh, they basically designed by AI from scratch um, and that's been done by training AI on a lot of faces for people that, that, exist on, that exist on Earth. And then AI went on, generalized, and designed those new faces. And it came away from, I would say, like 10 years ago, where we had to what we call manually feature engineer the features that go into AI. So the reason AI is now able to, to produce that, those high, very high quality images is because we're moving from hand-to-graphic features to more advanced feature. So if you take 
the best AI methods from about 10 years ago, then you would notice that it's mostly around the human picking and designing those what we call features space or uh, parameters that then you would feed into AI. So here's, here's an example of like a face recognition system where you had to identify the position of the eyes, the distance between them, the nose, the mouth, and the, the space of the face. And then from there, you can start tracking and identifying um, the person in the image. Right now, um, and I would say about six, seven years ago, there's been, um, I would say, a breakthrough in AI or machine learning with the, with the introduction of uh, methods called deep learning methods. And these are basically methods that are able to, de to detect the features that are important for labeling or for segmenting specific images directly from the pixels in that image. So we basically remove the human from the loop. We feed into AI the, the raw pixels of the image. And then that deep learning model, that big, huge um, machine or network is able to automatically link the important features to the task that you're training for, whether it's labeling the image, whether it's segmenting it and so on and so forth. And since the inventions of those methods about seven years ago, there has been a huge um, innovation that's happened in the space of, of images, of text recognition, of text censuses. So we've seen AI being able, for instance, to, to produce those very nice uh, realistic images that we've seen before, but also being able to write short stories, for instance, or to um, synthesize a new kind of uh, speech based on uh, somebody's voice and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with some of those um, recent examples. And behind the scene, what you, what you really see is basically a very complex, I would say, mathematical model that try and um, adjust billions of parameters to learn a specific task. So you feed in the image, um, as, I, as I mentioned, as a raw pixels, and then you try and train that model, train those um, links and nodes within the model to learn the association between the image and the task that you're training for. And the reason they started to work um, recently is because of the huge amount of processing power that we have in place um, that led to the ability to train models of billions of different parameters and adjust those parameters to this task. But one of also the main reason they started to work is the availability of data. So we have now libraries, for instance, or uh, data sets for images, labeled images that have millions of, of images in them that allow us really to just drop um, conventional methods of training, training machine learning models and then move into training these deep learning models very, very efficiently. But again, that really required the computational power, as I mentioned, but also very high quality labeled data set to be able to adjust those billions of parameters to the task at hand. And then from there, obviously, people start picking up um, on this invention and start looking into ways of applying this technology to other domains. Uh, naturally, one of those uh, domains is drug discovery, just because of the uh, I'd say the, the impact. So if you if you manage to, to train AI, if you manage to apply AI successfully to the drug discovery, that can really be transformative because by the end of the day, you're looking at discovering of new drugs or new medicines that could transform uh, people's life. And that's I think, think personally at least is, is kind of a very a very noble <laughs> noble mission, I think. So since, uh, since then, as you can see, the number of applications using those AI methods to drug discovery has increased significantly. And just in 2010, for instance, uh, the number of applications from there onwards has exceeded the, the total number of applications in that field for the previous history. So people start picking up those methods and try basically to try to apply those methods in the drug discovery space. And the, the way to think about it is that, back to our um, image example, you would need a way to represent that input and to feed it into machine learning models. With images, the task was, I would say, relatively simple since all you had to do is basically to feed in the, the image as, as pixels and the, the machine learning model will, will kind of carry on the task. With, with chemistry, it's a bit more complex because there are so many ways we can capture or we can represent um, small molecule drugs. Um, and there is, I, I would say that it's like, even with the, with the best representation available, we can't really fully capture all the properties of small molecules. As, as you know, there's a lot of um, quantum mechanical properties that are there that some, some of them are very heavy. 
to compute even with, with existing um, quantum computers in place. So what people start working on is again similar to, to existing um, to, to traditional machine learning approaches, what we call 1D fingerprint, which is basically the 1D descriptor of um, specific features extracted by hand or defined by hand, extracted from uh, from molecules and then fed into machine learning models. With the introduction of deep learning approaches, people started looking at what we call a graph-based representation of compounds, which you can see on the upper right corner of, um, of this figure. So basically feeding um, nodes and connections and atoms into the model and the model will automatically try and find a way, find, find basically ways to kind of um, correlate the, the placement and the connections between those nodes and atoms the structure and the, the accuracy of the model that we're training for. So there are many different ways and many different ways to combine those to build, to build accurate machine learning models. But by the end of the day, you would need a lot of those chemical structures and you need big data sets with labeled data. So those chemical structures and then a label, um, say like in an Excel file that tells you whether this compound, for instance, is toxic, whether it's soluble, whether you can take it orally, for instance, as a bill, um, and so on and so forth. There are like a number of different parameters that you would care, uh, care about, obviously, if you're developing those drugs to, to reach the patient and to reach the market. So in, in today's term, if you are to train machine learning models on, um, on chemistry, um, if you would like to apply it, for instance, to design novel chemistry or to um, know which of those chemical structures are likely to work on a human. You'd usually need what we call the crystal structure of the protein, which is the three, 3D model that I've, shown, that I've shown you. And you'd need usually hundreds to thousands of um, basically big data sets with hundreds of thousands of um, chemical or labeled chemical data sets. So basically the, the structure of the compounds and their properties. And using those combined uh, data sets, then you can feed those into machine learning models and machine learning models can then try and prioritize the compound that you would like to test in the lab or try and design novel compounds from um, unseen chemical spaces that we human haven't really even thought of. But then if you look at exactly what is the amount of data that is available to train such model, um, then you would notice that we don't really have much. So back to, to my argument around um, how hard it is to develop a new drug, you would imagine that a very few number of drugs reach um, clinical stages, uh, very few, even fewer are, are in the market. I think that, like, the estimate now is like around, basically just thousands of compounds are FDA approved and reach the market. So the, the data is basically just sparse. If you compare thousands to millions of data points for say, for instance, for, for images and text, there's a big difference in the number of, um, in the size of data that's available to us to train machine learning models efficiently. So in, in this figure, you basically see the, um, it's basically an illustration of the number of compounds reported on each target. And the, the, the the x-axis is basically the target that, are, that we know are disease-associated. Disease um, so basically targets in our body that we know are causing um, or participating in causing certain diseases. And then on the y-axis is the number of compounds reported in the literature in the patent. So that's kind of curated from all the data that is available to us. That tells us that this compound, for instance, works on, um, on that specific disease and so on and so forth. And you can see that it's very skewed. So we have very, very small number of targets with a lot of compounds reported on them. And then you have that very, very long tail of thousands of targets that we as humanity haven't really been very successful in discovering drugs for. And that's it, it, what the kind of the takeaway from this figure is, is two things. One is that data is obviously not as rich as in other domains, but also that we as a human have been very uh, biased and constrained in how we think about designing new drugs. Because those, those, that small number of targets that you can see on the left is basically the target that we, we human have been successful in designing drugs for because we have been, it, it's becoming an area that we're familiar with really. So it's relatively easier. But as we discover more and more drugs and more and more targets, and as we associate those targets with diseases, and a lot of those targets are targets that we, we just kind of we're seeing for the first time. So it's, it's really difficult, really challenging to design novel, uh, design new drugs for those. 
So COVID, for instance, actually SARS uh, MPRO is, is one example of those targets. It's the first time we've seen such targets. So it's taking us a lot of time to develop an oral drug, so drug that you can take in the mouth, for instance. Um, so from that figure, um, what we've realized is that really the world is missing out on more, on more than 80% of target causing diseases, that long tail of target that we have no clue about how to design drugs for. That's really challenging. And we as a company really wanted to change that. So over the past, um, I would say, five years I've been working in the AI for drug discovery space. And just over the past two years, um, as part of Clements AI, we've been able to design um, new classes of machine learning model that are what we call more data efficient, that can work successfully from fewer data points, from less data. And we have applied those methods to a number of uh, challenging use cases where we know traditional machine learning approaches are not really as efficient um, in tackling. So I'm, I'm going to talk about um, three use cases here, actually two of them, I'm going to focus on just, just on two of them just for the efficiency of time. So one is around the discovery of novel inhibitors or like what we call novel, basically um, starting point for drug um, for keep one, which is a very challenging target. And the other one is around building machine learning models that are more data efficient in a sense that it basically try and optimize for the amount of information that is gained per each data sample rather than having to, to, to basically feed it with more and more of labeled data. And the third one that um, we've been working on and we've been quite successful at is um, basically training our models on what's um, on libraries called Dell libraries or um, well, Dell data, which is basically DNA encoded library, which are usually libraries of billions of compounds but the data is usually very um, sparse in the sense that you get um, hundreds of millions of negative data samples, but only a few or like a handful of, of positive data. And then you, the task is to, to build the machine learning models, um, to build machine learning models from the, the, the very, very skewed databases. Um, so on to our first kind of use case, uh, which is identifying novel, novel drugs or novel candidates for, for challenging targets. So as I mentioned, um, we have lots of proteins in our body, and this is uh, just one of them. It's a target called KEEP1, and it's, um, it's associated with neurodegeneration, um, inflammation, and the number of cancers. And it's, very, it's been traditionally very challenging to design drugs um, for that specific protein, because as you can see, the, the pocket or like the binding site is kind of very um, shallow and deep. So it's kind of like a tube, really. And you need to design a, um, design a compound that fit within that binding pocket um, and that is small molecule. And that's quite quite tricky for such a such shape, such a shape of, a, of the binding pocket. Um, so we're not really aware of any drug in the market yet. Um, and we wanted to really try our technology on this one and see if we can start, since there is no drug in the market, there's not a lot of data available to train our models. So it was a very, very interesting use case for us. Uh, so what we basically done is that we took that structure of the protein um, and we identified one um, what we call a fragment, which is basically a subset of, um, of a molecule, which can basically, it's a, it's a fragment of, of a complete or a whole fledged molecule that you can grow in different directions to, to make a complete, um, complete small molecule that interact with the target in a specific way. And what's really nice about what we've done is that we really basically fed that crystal structure and that fragment into machine learning models and asked, asked our model to come up with novel um, expansion of that fragment with knowledge about the binding site that allows us to identify novel chemical entities or novel uh, starting point for, for a drug. And during that kind of process in, in a number of cycles, we managed to identify three inhibitors or three potential candidates for, for a drug. We, we purchased those compounds, we tested them in the lab, and one of them is active. So one of them showed very nice activity on that target. And we're now following up um, on further studies to kind of optimize that, that potential drug candidate. And what's really nice about it is that that, that drug that has been completely designed by, by the machine learning model is very similar or it, it ducks or like it, the, the 3D conformation, the, the, the 3D pose that it uh, inhibits or that it, um, it sits in the binding pocket with a 3D pose that is very similar to the ones designed by, by human experts, by an from um, Aztecs and GSK. 
And just to illustrate how, how kind of nice and efficient that process is, we've done that whole process in under six weeks. We prioritized three compounds, tested them in the lab, and one of them is, is, is an active hit compound. If you, if you are to do that within traditional, with like traditional ways, then it would probably have taken a year. Um, you would have to, to test in the lab thousands of compounds to reach that end point. And I think what's really exciting is that it's a complete novel chemotype. It's a complete novel, novel hit, which, which hasn't really been designed by a human before. And we know that a lot of groups are working on it. So it's, it's really exciting to see AI designing something of, um, of value here. So the other problem that we, we're tackling that we're working on is using machine learning models for property prediction. And that is really important because usually you, um, you have those chemical libraries, um, you have identified a number of hits and you wanna optimize those hits. You wanna basically uh, prioritize a number of those to, to take into the next stage and you wanna optimize the properties of those beyond just the interaction with the protein. So for instance, you want in the KEEP1 example, you want that molecule to interact with KEEP1, but there is a whole set of other proteins in the body that you don't want that compound to interact with. So you don't, for instance, cause um, heart stroke, for instance, or any other deadly um, or toxic behavior. So there's an, a, a whole set of other parameters that you would like the, the, the molecules to have before you actually even think about testing it um, in a human body. So what we, what we did in this example is that we took a number of uh, databases, a number of uh, basically labeled data from both proprietary and public sources. And we trained different machine learning models in this case on what we call tox prediction. So how different tox parameters um, that make sure that the compounds are not toxic when it's, when it's tested in human. And the one you see on the upper right is uh, BBBB, which is blood brain penetration basically. So whether the compounds can access the brain or not. Um, sometimes you wanted to access the brain, for instance, if you have um, glioblastoma, if you have a brain cancer, and in other cases, you wanted the compound just to kind of be in the periphery and not have access to the brain. So we trained different machine learning models on, the, on those different properties. And we, we didn't just care about accuracy. Accuracy is a very important factor, but because we knew that we do not have a lot of data to train machine learning models, um, on a lot of use cases, we wanted the model to be as data efficient as possible. So we were optimizing for accuracy and for data efficiency at the same time. And what you see here in, in the blue line is basically machine learning model um, that is, I would say, a sim similar structure to, to the model that is in red, but is not optimized for data efficiency. So it, it basically just, you feed it the data and it optimizes, it, it kind of cycle until it reaches a certain level of accuracy. The one in red is a model that is more smart about the data. So you have the same data sets, the same model structure, but then the model optimizes for two parameters instead of one. One of them is accuracy, but the other is what we call information gain. So how much information I'm gaining or the model is gaining for each data sample. And by, by having that, that information together with accuracy, the models start being more creative or think more smartly about what data it needs in order to reach the, the ideal level of accuracy it can reach. And what you can see is that by, by following this strategy, our model starts to, to reach that level, the ideal level of accuracy significantly faster and with significantly less data than the other model. So in, in a lot of cases, you can see that the model reaches the same level of accuracy as the, the blue line with like almost 50%. In some of them, you, you, you hardly need 20% of the data to reach that level of accuracy, which is really great because then you can integrate those models with a live program. So you don't have to wait for instance until the end of the program, you have all the data you feed, that, the, the, you feed that, those data into, into the model and then the model start producing results. And then if you need more data, then you have to, to test a, lot, a whole lot of um, compounds and then you kind of repeat that cycle. With this model, you can integrate this model with, with the live program as it goes on. And the model at each stage will tell you which compound you need to test, not just to get to your own endpoint faster, but also to get to a better model that helps you get to that endpoint point in a more efficient way. 
So we're using those models in a number of, of, um, of programs at the moment with a number of collaborators. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of touch at the end of the talk of like our vision of like where we see AI, AI is going and what's kind of the role that we're playing in, in this space. I think from, from what, I, what, I, what I talked about, um, you can probably tell that our focus is on making machine learning models more, more data efficient. And by achieving this goal, we believe we will then tap into opportunities that are unavailable and um, unprecedented really before. Our ideal goal is to be able to build a technology that is able to address 100% of the disease associated targets. And we really believe that we can't reach that number if, we, if, they, if machine learning is still as hungry as it is right now. So we need to be, to, to be thinking in a smart way, more smartly about how to design better machine learning models. So with that, with that mission in mind, I think the, the, for, for those of you who have been following our story and um, our company's development, so the company Glamorous AI is about two years old at the moment. And we've just, um, I think last month or two months ago, um, we merged with a company in, in the US called XChem, uh, which is one of the leading provider of DNA coded libraries and also chemistry services. And with that integration, we basically, we were very kind of excited about this because it's not just about AI anymore. We're integrating AI very, very closely with data and experts. So the data that comes from Dell and from Incinet Chemistry is usually very rich. Um, and we want to train AI in a supervised and unsupervised way to, to learn from those data points and to be able to kind of to really transform how job discovery is being done. But also within that integration, I think one of the main aspects that we were really excited about is accessing experts. Um, so the XCAM people, XCAM team has previously put, I think more than 12 drugs in the market. So that really brings a lot of drug discovery expertise to our team. And um, I think we're now the leader in kind of putting all those aspects, AI data and experts under one umbrella to be able to, to provide the best AI services. And I think one of the main aspects that I'm really excited about by, by integration by, by our integration with XCAM is the fact that we are not really developing those methods to just use it internally or, no, or like just on our own programs. We are really kind of, the, the ultimate aim is to be able to provide those services to any uh, drug hunter, any medicinal chemist who is working on disease and who is looking to uh, really use AI, see how it works and hopefully integrate AI with um, with the drug discovery programs. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all for, for your time, for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nua, that was, that was really fascinating. Um, I certainly provoked a lot of questions and thoughts that, that I'm dying to ask, uh, and there's some coming in in the Q&A as well. And I just remind everybody watching, um, please post your questions in, in the Q&A function, um, not in the chat, but in the Q&A function. Um, and also, if you would like to ask your question live, so if you'd like to turn the camera on and ask your question live to Nur, please write, uh, ask live. Uh, in brackets at the end of your question, um, and we can then bring you on as a, as a panelist to ask you your question directly. Um, of course, if you prefer to keep cameras off um, and put your question in the Q&A, that's absolutely fine, and I, I will read out those questions. Um, also a reminder, in case anybody missed the instructions in the introduction at the beginning, you can also upvote other people's questions. So if there's a question in the Q&A, which is similar to the one that you would like to ask, or um, if it's a question you'd really like to hear the answer to, please upvote those questions and we'll make sure that those questions get answered. Um, and we'll try and get through as, as many questions as we can uh, in, in the time that we have. Um, so I'll uh, jump to the questions in the Q&A. Um, okay, so yes, yeah, so question here is asking, what, it, what is special about the Rosalind approach? Um, is it to do with the new compound representation or perhaps the novelty in the machine learning model? Um, oh. It's, um, sorry, I'm not going to no. okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, it's a combination of both. Um, I think in, in the compound, in the representation side, we use uh, a whole lot of different representations and we integrate them all together under kind of a pool of featureization about the compound that we then let AI automatically pick the kind of the most relevant ones for a specific task. 
so we're not really limited to, to any specific type of representation and we let the machine learning model decide which one are relevant. And on the machine learning side, we have proprietary methods um, that really allows us to work very efficiently with, uh, with noisy data and with, with small data sets. So we have proprietary generative models, for instance, that works um, that work very well with, with Fragment. Um, and we have proprietary, for instance, noise reduction methods that allow us to deal with noisy, sparse data sets. We have so we have one person who's who is saying that we'd like to ask live. I'm going to pass the name on to our uh, events team in the background who will promote um, Terence Terence Agbello to panelist, um, and Terence can ask a question live in, in just a moment. Uh, in the meantime, we have another question here from from um, Sal Samar Salem, um, asking how hard is it for a data scientist or a machine learning engineer to apply machine learning for drug discovery without the help of chemistry experts? Um, and if it's possible, what would you suggest as a simple scientific resource to start with? Oh, that's that's a very interesting one. I think you have to do your homework and learn a lot about chemistry yourself if you want to do it without chemist. But even with that, you you can only reach that far because there's a lot of chemistry and biology expertise that goes into um, kind of the selection of the target that you would like to kind of apply the, the methods on um, and just kind of filtering, analyzing the output of machine learning models, integrating the right methods in the right kind of order. So there is a lot of chemistry expertise that, that comes in play, to be honest. And I, I would say the best performing teams that I've seen are the multidisciplinary teams that bring all people together, like from medicine chemistry, computational chemistry, and machine learning, data science. Um, if you like, there are a lot of right now. The kind of the, really the field has been blooming over the past few years, and there's a lot of resources out there, like whether like blogs, books, papers, like huge amount of papers um, that you can take as a starting point. Just pick pick kind of the area that's like you, you can easily get lost. Pick the area that you're, you're interested in, whether it's like the design of novel chemistry or, like, or the, the prediction or like even like Dell is now the kind of DNA code library is, is a paradigm on its own. So pick the right area and just start digging um, and we're hiring. So if, you, if you're interested, just kind of contact me and you can probably join the team and learn with us. Well, a great offer. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we have um, Terence Agbello now here as a, as a panelist. So Terence, if you'd like to turn your, your camera and mic on, you can ask your question to Anur. Yeah, hi, Noor. Uh, many thanks okay. for your presentation. So I'm a, I'm a PhD student at uh, the University of Sheffield, uh, focusing on biomedical knowledge graphs at the moment. I was quite curious to ask um, if you have knowledge graphs at any point in your pipeline if you've got any use cases or methodologies around integrating heterogeneous um, data sources in that form. Yeah. Um, we're looking at knowledge graphs for, for a project that I haven't actually get the time to, to touch on. So we, we have an um, innovative gay grant to work on glioblastoma with King's College London. Um, so in that kind of project, we were looking at knowledge graph and um, systems network, basically, to integrate a drug drug interaction, drug protein interaction, CRISPR data, and those kind of, um, I would say, disparate sometimes data sources for target identification and pathway analysis. Um, so at the moment, it's not really in the kind of hit to preclinical candidate stage, but it's kind of in the stage before where you before you start your drug discovery program, you need to know which targets you're, you're actually working on and which, which are the most kind of disease relevant. So that's kind of where we're, where we're integrating at the moment. And is that for more of a embedding approach or do you work directly on the, on the graph structure? Because at the moment there's a lot of, a lot of hype around uh, graph deep learning. So graph deep of, learning, yeah. Uh, it's, they, 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 there's a lot of hype, I agree. It's like they, they're quite tricky to, to converge in, in, in a lot of scenarios. So with, with the graph deep learning on those types, um, we, we're using graph deep, deep, deep networks, but also, also embedding, embedded. So it's, it's, we're not really strict, I would say. We try to keep very open mind about which technology we use where. So we try everything that we, we know of that could potentially work and we see what works and we go with that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Terence. Thank you for being our, our first live uh, audience question. <laughs> um, we have one other uh, um, audience member who's who's offering to ask live with a slight caveat of perhaps the AV setup not being amazing, but let's give it a go. <laughs> so um, Austin Tripp, um, 
would like to ask a question live, we can bring on as a, as a panelist. Um, we have another question here from uh, an anonymous attendee asking, how did you identify the initial scaffold to use as a data point for your model? Uh, that's a very good point. We actually looked at the literature. So we looked at um, the hits that have been identified or screened against KEEP1. Um, and those are usually either fragments or compounds. We broke those compounds into, into fragments in, in some, of the, some of the cases. We analyzed the docking poses and just kind of from a chemistry point of view, which ones, uh, which ones was, was the ones that are most promising. Um, so that's basically how, how we did it. Um, okay, we have another question here saying that you mentioned that being able to deal with noisy data is a novel aspect of your model. Um, so can you describe further what is noisy data in terms of drug discovery and explain how noisy data affects the generation mm. of molecules? Oh, there's a lot of aspects to noisy data and drug discovery. I mean, we, we're dealing with data sets of like um, metabolism, like cleavance and solubility, log D, um, like a lot of average miscan properties. And what we found is that in a lot of those data sets, there is either disagreement or like a margin of error in, um, in a lot of the, the data that we have access to. Um, in a lot of cases, for instance, you, you screen compounds in different, um, in, in the same assay, but in like different conditions, and that create different differences or variations in, uh, in the labels that you get. Um, and the, we, we actually just kind of realized that if you apply a noise reduction methods before you feed those, those labels into the, the machine learning models and after prediction as well to kind of um, just tune the, the final set that gives you a, a very big boost in, in the model accuracy. Yeah, yeah great. Um, I can see we have Austin Tripp now here as, as a panelist. Austin, would you like to turn on your uh, camera and, and ask your question? Hi there, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we yes, can. Yeah. Great. Thanks for the amazing talk. I just wanted to ask a little bit about evaluation of these models. In particular, there's like two broad uh, categories of evaluation metrics that I've seen. One is called prospective, where you try to use your model to, to discover something and see how well you do. And the other is retrospective, where you pretend you don't know something already and you try to rediscover it. And that generally it's been reported there's a gap between these two metrics that retrospective often tends to overestimate performance. Um, and so I just wanted to get your thoughts on this and what you think is best practices for evaluating these kinds of models for discovery? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I think one of the main probably bottleneck in, in AI for drug discovery is that it's it's expensive to, to evaluate machine learning models because your, your ideal test is, is really getting that compound to the lab really and test it in the assay and it's active. And that's kind of just like reduce the discussion around like whether it's active, inactive, discovered like in, in a de novo design or whatever, right? So ideally, we would, we would test it in the lab once it's been confirmed by computational, uh, by our data science, by machine learning, by chemist and, and all of that, then, then we go to the lab. In terms of, I think your question is probably more around like benchmarking. So how we make sure that the model is performing well when we, when we train it, for instance. Um, and we, we really use the combination of what you mentioned. So we basically, uh, but that depends on the case. So we've done some, in, in some scenarios, basically reinventing what's been invented, really. So if you take, for instance, kinases, which is a big class of, um, of proteins in our body, and those are usually data rich. So you can train our model, you can train a machine learning model, and then you can um, let that model rediscover non-kinase non inhibitors. And if it does that, or like if it comes close to that, then you would know that's performing well, because it's, it's kind of moving toward that right direction. But in, in KEEP1, for example, you, you can't really do that. And in, an all, in, a, in a whole lot of other targets, because the, the, I mean, our main proposition is that we work on targets where data is not available. So how we make sure that the, the, the outcome of the model is, um, is, is high enough quality. So we, we basically, we, we train it on, on, known, on known targets first to, to make sure that it's performing. But then with, with Keep One, for instance, we, we just had to, to go to the lab as, as soon as we can to, to test the compounds. Um, but there's a, like if from a virtual point of view, there's like, people are coming up with more and more matrices to kind of compare machine learning models from kind of novelty um, of the scaffold that's being produced, for instance, the diversity of the chemical sets. So you can, can like have a whole set of matrices that you can just tick before you actually make sure that you're ready to go to the lab. 
Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Austin. I guess we have a question here from uh, Lena Schmidt. Um, and she asks, so on, on the slide with the random active learning graphs, it looked like the model performance dropped towards the end when almost all training data were used. Is there an explanation for this? Um, is there something that could be avoided, um, perhaps from overfitting, adjusting learning rates, et cetera? Or is this normal for the field in this data, for the data in this field? Sorry. Yeah, I think we, we could we could certainly kind of stop it before it reached that point. We, we kept it going just because we were, we're comparing with, with random and we wanted to kind of reach the, the the final point where it fed all, all the data to the model. My assumption is that it's probably the kind of the, the data of like, it, it had to get all the data in just for conversion purposes, but not all the data is rich enough in, form, in, in information. So probably over overfitting at, at that stage. Okay, um, we have another question here um, saying, thank you for the great talk. In the KEEP1, K-E-A-P-1 -E example, <laughs> Um, how much of the discovery process was AI compared to human intelligence? Um, and what does the AI do well? Where does the human expertise come into the process? Right. So it was a mix, but I would say about 80% AI, 20% human. So the human picked the, the fragment, for instance, the starting point for, for the drug discovery process, um, and obviously cleaned the, and prepared the crystal structure of the protein. Um, and then from there on, it was mostly AI. So designing novel ideas, filtering, analyzing, and prioritization, um, doing the doping um, and the molecular mechanical calculations and so on and so forth. And then the human will come in at the end, the end just kind of to look at the doping process, see if they, they make any sense. And then there, there will be a, a, a medicinal chemist basically looking at the quality of the compounds and deciding whether they they should go to the to, to validation as a, as a validation or we should do another cycle. So the design is, is all by human. And I think that's where, where I is really good at because then you can really remove some of the bias in the human design of chemistry and introduce the, the AI kind of more creative aspect of, of drug design. Mm. That was really fascinating. I was supposed to um, yeah, take my uh, chair's discretion <laughs> to follow up on a question on my own. Now, how does that, the, the challenges that that raises then in terms of, say, um, explainability or transparency in, yeah. in AI models, um, if sense is kind of 80% by, by AI, uh, and you were talking in your talk around, you know, the advances in terms of deep learning, um, I guess that brings with it challenges of explainability or transparent, uh, challenges of kind of transparency around how the model is been developed and how it is designed um, and I wonder kind of how you address that in terms of the drug development or in terms of kind of what the um, applications are yeah, it's, around this. Yeah yeah it's, it's a hot topic like yeah like explainability of AI I think is, is now a hot topic and I think chemists are kind of fair to ask is like how, how is this working how it's coming up with those ideas and it's, it's a tricky I mean we, we we don't like know exactly why AI come up with like those kind of compounds th those designs specifically it's it's hard to kind of just um analyze billions of different parameters and know which ones are contributing to what you can do it on a high level but not on a satisfactory level i'd say yeah uh, but, but but by the end of the day if it is i mean the, the way i like I, I like to think about it is like if it is a drug that is active against the target and it is in a high enough quality that a, a medicinal chemist would look at it and he wouldn't know whether it's designed by a human or or a machine and if the, the, the end goal is to really cure diseases, I, I wouldn't really care about who and how that, that compound is designed. I, I just want to put it in patients, right? I don't know. That's, that's the way I, I think about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, certainly it's a, a very hot topic at the moment, for explainability and transparency, yeah, and, and a very challenging one to, to, to address. Um, could we have another question here? Um, again, saying thank you for the great talk. Um, it's sometimes the case with DELs that a molecule that, in theory, that, that should in theory have been synthesized is not, um, and as a result would be classed as inactive when it might just be missing from the library. Uh, is there a way to account for this when modeling? Um, compound that is missing. So it's, it feels like, um, I don't know if I fully understand the question. So it's been synthesized, being synthesized is not, should it be being synthesized? Or is also been, so you do mean like the compounds does exist in the library that's been screened and classified as inactive or does not exist in the library in the first place? 
So in, in either case, so if it does not, in, it, I mean, if it is not in the library in the first place, the machine learning model, that's kind of one of the main promise of machine learning, because then you can train machine learning models on the compound that has been identified as active. And then you get that machine learning model that's been trained on those to identify the ones that should also be classified as active, but did not, for instance. And those can either be from, from the library or from any other commercial, commercially available libraries. Um, if it's been misclassified um, within the, the library, then the machine learning model should be able to generalize enough to either flag that one as kind of um, misclassified. So you can really follow up on that and just check whether you can design better libraries, for instance. Um, I hope that that answered your question. <laughs> Um, if, if the audience member who asked that um, wants to follow up with a follow up question, please do. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, the next question then is Have you ever worked on VH, VHHs and nanobodies? No, no, I would love to learn more about it. No, but if, if you're interested, I would love to, to look to, yeah, to learn more. I mean, drop me a line. Yeah, it's something to make, make contact about on that one. Um, okay, so the next question is, have you used this model for um, target identification or validation? We are at the moment with the glioblastoma. So the, the project I talked about um, with Innovative Can Kings, uh, we, we are building models. I, would, I, I usually call them Amazon style models. So basically um, model that learn from existing pathways and existing drug um, target and target disease associations to prioritize new target um, from a dataset, and we've successfully identified novel targets for, for glioblastoma that we are now um, basically screening against. So we, we are doing that, yeah. Um, well, loads of questions coming in now, Tony. <laughs> keep, keep on talking about <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> and just a reminder to uh, people in the audience to please upvote questions if you if there's a question that's similar to the one that you'd like to ask or if there's a question that you really would like an, uh, to hear an answer to please upvote other people's questions as well as uh, continuing to put in your own questions yeah um, very good audience by the way but, I mean, <laughs> questions <they're> just, <laughs> keep on coming <laughs> yeah. um so the question that's currently been up, upvoted twice um is does the model consider compound toxic toxicity or the data set con or are the data, data set compounds are already tested safely, safe clinically. If the model only trains on safe compounds, how challenging is it to consider toxicity and expand the explorable drug space? True. So we we consider both. You can't, and that's basically because you can't read really train machine learning models on just uh, positive samples. You have you, you have to, to have at least a few that are negative, and um, if if you don't, then you have to, to kind of get some somehow, whether like some synthetically or like just test this in the lab so we we create data from the the data that you usually find in patents and public literature is a kind of a mix between positive and negative samples but you usually get positive more than more than negative and that's why you need to be smart about like how you sample and how you balance the data before you train machine learning models um but tox specifically is um is a challenging one because it's one of the those kind of data sets that are coming from basically human or like animals where the data is significantly even less than what you, you, you find, for instance, for other properties that are kind of up, up the funnel. So we, we're, we're looking at ways now to kind of integrate more and more data and be, be smarter about how we design models for this. Um, so, so this next question, I think it's around uh, potential collaborations or potential ways of, of uh, working with, with your model. So there's a, a question here asks, what is the process of a, if a PhD student based in London wants to arrange with you to use Rosalind at some point of the project? Are there any IP issues that would cause trouble when publishing results? Um, not really. So we, we're building Rosalind as kind of um, really kind of an API. So it's a, we, we have an interface um, that people with no background in, in machine learning or uh, data science can kind of well, we hope it's going to be intuitive to use and seamless to integrate with different drug discovery uh, pipelines. And we, we we like publications. Most of the people in the team are have research uh, academic background um, and mostly scientists with PhDs. So we understand the pressure around um, publications and we will be happy to kind of dis discuss that, yeah. Um, so it's possibly another one to uh, reach out and, and, and make contact uh, if you want to follow up on that one. Um, 
because the next question is, thank you for the great presentation. Um, which drugs are you working on? Um, so for example, uh, dental, cardiology, cancer, other particular areas that you're working no. on? on so we, yeah, we are therapeutic area agnostic. Again, the, we kind of position ourselves as a service provider in a way that we, again, we don't want to build our own, we, we don't want to keep the technology to ourselves and just use it internally and pluck it from, from the, the rest of the world. I know a lot of people and players in the market have it, that kind of strategy and that's fine. But really, we kind of really motivated to, to open it up for, for everyone who would like to use it on different um, therapeutic areas, different programs. And we always don't have that kind of therapeutic area focus internally or expertise internally. So anyone who's like have biology expertise or chemistry expertise would like to, to use the technology, please just let me reach out. We, we're happy to kind of support. That's great. Uh, okay, so the next question is, you mentioned that your, your method um, needs a 3D model of your target. Um, how does your model use this information? Um, that's actually the way we compensate for the lack of data on the kind of labeled data side. Um, because we use the 3D model, of the, pain, the model is very much informed around, um, have a lot of information about the size of the compound that fits with the pocket. Um, basically, we call it domain, um, domain data that we feed as kind of input to the model together with the, with the fragment that I talked about. And that like goes all the way from the, the polarity of the binding pocket, the, the, the different types of atom within that kind of region, the size of it, um, the, the preferred the 3D confirmation and so on and so forth. So all that information is fed into the model so that when, when it designs a novel compound, it's not just kind of blindly exploring a huge search space. It's constrained that search space within the, within the domain of the binding pocket. Uh, okay, so our next question then is from uh, Kweko Akweyi. Um, to what extent do current in silico methods accurately model the entire admit um, pharmacokinetic process? That's a very good one. Um, the, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, it's it's hard to, to pinch mark. Um, my, my observation is that a lot of the methods that's been reported in the public or like in, in papers even published and, and all of that, they don't really translate when we test them on commercial uh, commercial programs with like uh, partner data and so on and so forth. Um, th there still has to be a lot of work in like standardization and reproducibility, I would say, and like data availability and, and so on and so forth. And that's that I think we like internally, we spend, I would say like 89% of our time just curating data and making sure that we have the right data in the right format to and in kind of enough of it to train accurate machine learning models but um we haven't had a single say, use case where published data has been reproduced on, on a live program so far uh, so quite a few questions coming in um i want just to remind everybody if anybody else would like to ask a question live if you want to uh, turn your camera on and, and ask a question uh, live to noor um please just remember to to write uh, the word live at the end of your question and we can bring you on as panelists i think we probably have time to bring on one or two more panelists so if you if you'd like to do that uh, now's your chance to put your question in and, and write live afterwards and we can get you on um okay so next question uh from ellen mcdonough um what was the training set that you used for the initial Rosalind approach to identify the to identify the successful compound? The training set to identify is that so if it, if you're talking about the keep one example, we just um, we just fed the, the kind of the, the crystal structure and the pro and the, the crystal structure of the protein and the and the fragment. If you're talking about admit physical properties, um, then again we we have the Kind of a combination of publicly available data, but then since our integration with XChem um, and their medicinal chemistry group, we also have access to a lot of assay data from, from the labs that we are training our machine learning models to kind of cover as much as possible from the admit physchem property landscape to help with prioritization. If you're talking about Dell, um, then we, we again with, with XChem we have access to Dell data. Um, we use that model to train our machine learning models. And then we use those models to screen um, MQ and, and real. Um, so we now have cap capacity to screen 4 billion compounds in, in a few days um, to identify novel hits. And obviously the ultimate test in that is then the, the assay. We, we screen in the lab and we, and that's our measure of accuracy. 
Uh, okay, so we have the, another question here. Um, what other problems can Roslyn tackle apart from targets with unknown ligands? Um, so we can, I have to say, we, we can do like known like target families or like very well studied uh, target families pretty much as good as everyone else. So if you like have, um, I think they've seen a few examples in the literature like around kinases, for instance. Um, so those are relatively easier for, for machine learning. We can do this as well. Um, we're discussing a number of targets like in, in the GBCR family. Um, those are more tricky. Um, and then again, like low data targets are basically, um, we have unique technology that allow us to, to address those. Uh, but again, we're not therapeutic area agnostic. We're not target specific. So it's the target selection is usually driven by, by our clients and not by us. And we, we sit together and we discuss whether it's um, something we can work on together. Uh, okay, uh, one more question in, in the Q&A at the moment um, from Linus Lazardis. Hi, Linus. Every... Hi, Linus. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, apologies to everybody whose, whose name I've mispronounced today. I feel there's probably been, been quite a few of them. <laughs> uh, but Linus says, thanks, thanks for this talk. Um, does your platform assess the synth synthetic tractability of identified hits? Yeah, we do. We do realize that it's very important that the, the compound that we identify are either commercially available or that or can be synthesized, otherwise there's no point really. So we've integrated synthetic tractability um, measures in the kind of the, the funnel that we use to filter the compounds. So it's it's one of the measure just to make sure that we, we, we have compounds that are accessible. Yes, that's a very important measure that we have. Um, so as questions I've been dying to ask you about um, in terms of like the, the future of, of biomedical research and the, the you know, increasing applications of AI and of machine learning um, to drug discovery and, and biomedical research. Um, and I'm really, really interested to hear your views, um, you know, your background coming from kind of academic research, moving into industry and, and the, kind of the range of skills and expertise that you've um, developed through that process. Um, I'm really curious what you think, like if you were to think like in five to 10 years time, in terms of what the future of biomedical research would be or the future of drug discovery, like what are the, um, the kinds of skills and expertise that are going to be kind of really key to the future of this? And, and to what extent does that mean that say biomedical researchers are going to need to have expertise in AI or machine learning um, or what kind of combination of, of, of skills and expertise yeah. are needed for the, for the future? Um, so skill wise, I think it's, it, I mean, in, in, it feels like it has to be a mix, right? I mean, no drugs, like drug discovery person or like no machine learning or data science person can, can do much on their own. Um, we start to keep one, like as data scientists, when we start working on, on kind of a proof point, but as soon as we start developing those compounds, we, we immediately felt like we, we need chemistic expertise, we need computational chemistic expertise. We can't go so far like just by, by ourselves. And I feel like the future of like, I, whether it's like successful, successful companies in the field or whether it's like um, organizations or academic groups, there has to be like a mix of people with different backgrounds and different um, skill sets to kind of talk to each other. And I think one of the probably most important factor in, in this kind of ecosystem, the pharmaceutical biotech sector, life science sector, is the fact that people need to be, to be open-minded about like AI, machine learning, and um, like whether it's designed by human, whether it's designed by a machine, and just kind of keep our eye, our eye on, on the goal. It, I mean, as, as long as we're curing diseases, as long as we're putting, curing, um, we're putting drugs in, in patients, we're shortening the timelines, reducing the budget, we're doing good. I mean, nobody has kind of to, to take the claim on the compounds, it's just, it's a compound, it's a drug, and you have to put in patients. And it's developed, I feel like it's gonna mostly be developed collaboratively. There's no drug that's been designed by AI or like by, by a computational chemist or medicinal chemist. Most, a, most drugs developed in five years are gonna be designed by, by all of those three together. Yeah, um, and it's great to hear you talk about kind of the, the real, the goal or the, or the you know the aim of this to be about you know public benefit and and um, you know benefiting patients we have a kind of uh, uh, i guess a, a alternative perspective question here which asks is bioinformatics lucrative which i guess is the other <laughs> is side it? of <laughs> the other side of the coin uh, i think it's about it, in, within industry well if, yeah if, if it's not lucrative you can't really raise money and you can't really exist in this market so it, it has to be you have to find a way of making money otherwise you, 
you, you can't sustain really the, the kind of the, the rate of innovation. Um, so it, I mean, my, my expertise in the drug discovery space and from, from what, I, what I hear, pharmaceutical industry is making billions. So it, it has to be regrettable. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we have a couple more questions coming in now. So uh, from Terence Agbello, um, are you participating in any open source projects to share parts of your data processing, feature extraction, model development or model interpretation pipeline and best practices? Mm, that's a good one. I, I hope I have enough time to do that. <laughs> at the moment, at the moment we're not. Uh, but again, that might change in the future. Uh, again, another question here. Um, what is your opinion in using AI for rapid development of new drugs for COVID-19, considering the new variants and, and what could be a timeline for go-to-market? I'm not a vaccine expert, but I've, we've seen like the, the past two years were really impressive. It's like the, the, the rate of innovation, like the discovery of the, of, the, of the vaccines that we have now in place at that rate, at that speed was, was, was really impressive. And I think are unprecedented. So I, I'm, I'm usually an optimistic person, so I'm optimist. So my hope is that we will get something for like for the for the variants pretty soon, and we we don't have to go into another lockdown. But that's probably very optimistic. <laughs> I don't know. Um, AI has played a role in identifying repurposed drugs, so like all drugs that could potentially uh, be used for. Uh, for COVID, but I haven't really seen any reaching the market yet. I know a few of them are in now clinical trials, but, but not, in, not, not in the market. So probably vaccine is going to be the mainstream for some time. And on the topic of, of COVID-19, uh, I suppose an area of interest to mine, certainly in, in my research, is never around um, you know, public trust when used, uses of, of data and uses of AI, and particularly in healthcare context and medical context. Um, and I find it really fascinating to, to think kind of the impact or, or the potential changes from over the last couple of years for experiences of COVID-19 and certainly a sense that there's, there's a really increased public interest and public attention into processes of, of medical research um, and I mean, in vaccine discovery, if not drug discovery. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering how any of that has perhaps affected or, or has had impacts on, on your industry and that comes of kind of heightened interest in terms of processes of medical research and, and, yeah, and, and public interest and, and attention to that area. Has that had any impacts or, or changes for, for your industry and for your work? It, it, it certainly made my conversations like people are public <laughs> easier in a sense that now they kind of know what like what these like what targets are and like what they look like <laughs> for instance like the, the covid vaccine like image is now in everyone's minds i don't have to explain what, what they look like and like drug discovery and how in how in i would say inefficient it, it was at least in, in the past and like the, the kind of the improvements around it um so that that kind of made made it easier to have a conversation with um like just generally speaking i don't know like we we started the company for us in the lockdown and it really affected more kind of like the kind of the way we work and the rate of innovation and it's like how we access talent and, and all of that but, but i think from innovation or like from building company it, it didn't really had that kind of big big of impact so hopefully we have time for one more question um and this question here, what are, what are the bottlenecks for AI drug discovery other than data availability? What is the next challenge you want to address in AI drug discovery? And oh, that's sneaking in as two questions. <laughs> yeah, um, so bottleneck is not just data availability. I think it's data that is in a high enough quality to train a reliable machine learning model on. So that, that's one thing that I feel like we need to solve kind of data generation bit to kind of feed AI with the high quality machine learning and build the machine, reliable machine learning models. And again, that, that kind of was really the main motivation for us to, to integrate with XCAM because we've, we've done some pilots with them and we know the quality of the data they have. But then the other one is the, the rate of validation of the machine learning models. So in kind of in other domains, you can just build a machine learning model and you can validate it on a test set or whatever, and then you can put it in production and, and that's really it. In, in biomedical research, you have to, uh, prioritize compounds or like highlight the ones that are likely to work. You have to, to, to send it, to purchase those compounds, send them to the lab, test them in the lab, and then feed, and then that kind of feedback cycle comes, go, goes back. And that usually is kind of the process of from having the, the outcome of machine learning models to the process where you have the feedback outcome. That usually takes months. 
So one of the things that we were, we are working on now in, internally is, is ways to kind of just improve the cycle and make it like really shorter and shorter and shorter so that like within a few days or like a week max, we can just close that loop between AI machine learning, um, between AI data, like assay data and, and feed that back in. And I think that's kind of, in, in my mind, those are the kind of most probably important ones. But then, I mean, again, it's chemistry, biology are, are pretty complex. So back to, um, I think, previous discussion is like integration with other data sources, like Broad, for instance, Equifold, and like uh, CryoM, for instance, for high quality stru um, protein structures, um, identifying the structure for the target that we, we don't know the structure of and, and so on and so forth. Like, there's a lot of like different disciplines that you can integrate with to, to make the whole, um, the whole pipeline, the whole process way more efficient. I said it was the last question. I'm going to squeeze in one final question. Um, <laughs> a final question is: So, how much drug repurposing work is glamorous AI do? Sorry, how much drug repurposing work is glamorous AI doing at the moment? Mm, not much. Um, so we're doing that for glioblastoma. That's a part of the thing that we're doing for glioblastoma. Um, so, because again, it's it's a very little disease, and we want to go to market as as, as soon as we can, really. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, but beyond that, we haven't, yeah, the, there is the, the target that we work on. We're mostly um, noble hit, hit identification or more in the hit to lead and lead op. But since we've done it for, for the stomach, we, we do have kind of a sense about how it needs to be done and what they need to be integrated. Um, there's still questions in the Q&A, but I'm, I'm afraid that is all we have time for now. Uh, I think we could have, could have carried on chatting most of the evening. Um, it's really got people, got people interested in this. Yeah, it's, it's so much to discuss. Um, but I'm afraid that is all we have time for. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us this afternoon and for all your fantastic questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them, um, but it really has been inspiring to see so much enthusiasm. The Turing Lectures will be taking a break for a few months, uh, but we'll be back with an exciting lineup to see us through 2022. There's still plenty going on though. Um, and tomorrow, so Wednesday, the 1st of December, we'll be hosting the second event in our new series, Do Great Minds Think Alike? Um, this event will focus on confronting the human cost of climate change, and it runs from 1.30 to three o'clock um, tomorrow. So, and you can register free on our website. If you want to hear more about you know, Turing events, news and more, and you haven't already done so, please join our mailing list um, by heading to turing.ac.uk forward slash subscribe. Um, and you can keep up to date with all the news and events uh, and more that's going on at the Turing Institute. But finally, on behalf of everybody at the Alan Turing Institute, I'd like to thank Noor Shakur for, jo Noor Shakur for joining us today. Um, it really has been a pleasure to host you and I've, I've really enjoyed hearing about your work. Um, and thank you for taking the time to answer all the questions which just keep on coming. Um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us. Have a yeah. lovely evening. Thanks for having me. Cheers everyone, have a good day, bye-bye.